Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Australian Virtual Astronaut Challenge. I am really excited to have you here. It's such a great way to uh, really end the week, I must say. Uh, my name is Ben Newsom from Physics Education, but I'm not the only person involved in this particular session. You are uh, watching week two of the Australian Virtual Astronaut Challenge, a six-week design challenge all about growing things in space. And uh, really looking forward to the speakers today. But before I kick this off, I do want to acknowledge that I am meeting with you today here on, in Western Sydney in Durrett in land. And I'm so happy to be with you. And I want to acknowledge that all the traditional custodians of this land and in the land of which you work as well, really want to pay respects to our elders past, present and emerging. I want to extend that uh, respect right through, right across the country and around the world, because that's exactly what it's like. Uh, for this particular chat, for everyone joining here today, and especially for our, our Indigenous people in uh, Torres Strait Islanders as well. Thank you for coming along for this session. We do have a pack session again. Uh, so I do want to briefly uh, welcome the people who are on this panel and who will be chatting to you throughout this time. So just really going from left to right, uh, Dr. Scott Sleep from the STEM Industry School Partnerships. Would you like to say hello, please? Morning, all. I hope you're you're ready for some very interesting um, activities and some fantastic speakers today. Yeah, absolutely. Now, really looking forward to it. And I must say, a, a special guest today is uh, Jim Christensen. He is the Chief Innovation Officer of uh, the Aldrin Family Foundation. Uh, Jim, would you like to say hello? Yes, certainly would. Uh, it's great to be coming from Florida. And when you say good morning, I'm saying good evening. Good evening to you, Jim. Absolutely. And uh, coming back to C Sydney, uh, I I'm in on direct country in, in Western Sydney. Uh, uh, Alan, Alan, Alan Ryan, how are you doing? We have the adjunct professor from UTS Business School and the founder of Hargraves Institute. Uh, Alan, would you like to say hello? Yes. Good morning, Ben. And good morning to everybody. And I'm coming to you from Camaragal country, which is in Crow's Nest and Camaray. So I'm looking forward to it. Thank you very much. Much appreciated, uh, Alan. Thank you so much. And uh, Wendy Boat is not in Sydney. She's north of here. Uh, she's very much involved with the Queensland Virtual STEM Academy. Wendy, would you like to say hello? Good morning, everyone. I'm speaking to you from Townsville in North Queensland, the Wulgarukaba and Bindal traditional owners of this land. I am looking forward to today learning about your brainstorming ideas to solve this problem. 100% absolutely. And uh, coming from south of Sydney, much south of Sydney, actually, uh, Ian Preston, uh, River Eden STEM Project Officer and part of the New South Wales Virtual STEM Academy. Yeah, hi, Ben. Uh, coming to you from Griffith, um, beautiful part of Riverina in uh, regional New South Wales. Um, coming to you from Wiradjuri country. And I'd just like to acknowledge um, our, our elders, past, present and emerging. And we've got a great uh, session lined up for today and I can't wait to... Uh, to get uh, get into it it's going to be absolutely awesome absolutely now as some of you who are in the week one session because i know some people haven't seen that quite yet but week one we also got to meet uh ted tagami co-founder of magnitude.io out of berkeley california ted do you want to say good day please just for a moment hey there everyone good afternoon from berkeley california home of the alone indians um, I just was uh, really excited about the, uh, the projects that uh, we'll be seeing, the presentations uh, at the end of this six-week program. Getting to week two, I've got my notebook out. I'm taking some notes. I'm looking forward to what I learned today. Thanks, Ben. Thanks so much, Ted. Now, definitely. So if you ha well, haven't had to watch the, uh, the recording of week one yet, which is, in, is on the AVA website, your teachers do have that link for you. Uh, the um, last week was all about forming teams and really trying to get ahead in the game about how we might create some form of device, some way, some innovation that might be able to grow something in space, on the International Space Station or potentially on the moon. This week, it's all about project management. Really, you know, getting to business, <laughs> making things happen. That's exactly what it is. And also really framing, well, what is this about? Where would you might be putting it? And this is very much a a chat that Jim will definitely be able to guide us through when we talk about the moon very, very shortly. Now, one thing that is important for astronauts is that, yes, there's a lot of planning. There's a lot of thinking about how their mission might work, how to learn how to you know, fly, fly those rockets, use those rovers, do all the things that's necessary. But here's the thing. We also need to train like an astronaut. And I just thought just briefly, this is a real opportunity for us to have a think about our own fitness and perhaps 
over the next five weeks that we have left, what if we do a little bit of a fitness challenge? Generally, think about training like an astronaut. So tell you what, no matter where you are, get your fingers underneath your ear. Run your fingers along your mandible bone. You'll get to a pointy bit just there. Go past that pointy bit. Go to about there. And then drop on down. And you will feel your carotid pulse. Carotid is named after that artery that's going straight up there. There's actually one on the other side. They go both sides. If you feel it just there, not around there, not around there, just there, you'll feel a beat. Now, clearly, it's a beat of blood going up to your brain to keep you alive. We want to see if you can get yourself in a position where maybe we can improve our fitness a little bit and feel the number of beats drop over a minute between now and in a month's time after training, maybe we can get less beats there happening. Now, let's actually have a little look briefly at our heart. If I go over this way, go over here, go there, wait, do the thing. Thank you, do the thing. All right, it did the thing. Our heart sits about there. In fact, if you make a fist, like generally make a fist, put it there. Notice if I go sideways across, the adult human heart and your heart, to be honest, is the size of your fist. It really is. Now, what we can do is let's have a little look in closely. There we go. Good morning. Our buttons are a little bit cantankerous today. Right. So if we look at our heart, there are four chambers inside our heart. And the beat that you're feeling is not from the top two chambers. Ooh. It is from the bottom two chambers. When they squeeze hard, one side sends blood to your lungs only. And so that's why that side, that little chamber, that little ventricle is small. But the other side, the left ventricle, quite a large chamber, and that's the one that shoots the blood right around the whole body. We want to get ourselves in peak physical con condition as best we can, because if we're training like an astronaut, you generally have to be really ready to go. Because once you go up there, well, honestly, uh, you can have muscle wastage. And we're going to find out, especially when you look through the student folios, a, a bit more about what you can do to you know, get yourself in peak physical fitness. Now, just a little side note that so I thought we'd just mention that. And we will be checking in on your fitness through the, uh, the next few weeks. Now, by the way, this week is quite an interesting uh, week because we had a special announcement that came up with Australian space. Seriously, it, it's really exciting. And the best person to describe this is actually Scott. So, Scott, would you like to describe what's happened? Because when you told me, I was like, wow. Yes, Ben. Um, so I'm here with... Um breaking news, if you like. So um, NASA um, has just announced with the Australian Space Agency and an agreement to add a, an Australian-built rover mission to the moon in the next five years. So this is an amazing opportunity for young people to get involved in the space industry um, in the future. So this is part of the Artemis mission. Um, Artemis, which we mentioned last week, is, a, is about that series of, of uh, steps that's going to get us to the, to the moon and beyond, uh, and particularly looking at, at Mars. So Australia, because of its fantastic um, technical knowledge, particularly in uh, autonomous mining, has been chosen by NASA to do this work. So what it means is that we are going to be able to uh, work in space in ways that we hadn't imagined before. So this whole program is very, very timely in the fact that it's um, producing that. Now, one of the other opportunities I want to just mention to you um, that our program, the CIS program, is actually running for the first time next year, the International uh, Rover Challenge. So the International Rover Challenge is about building a rover to go to the moon or Mars. Uh, and that is going to be done using robotic systems. And we're going to have a competition at the International um, Convention Centre in Sydney in um, August next year. So keep attuned about what we're doing. You see in this slide here too, there's a, there's a map. That map um, is actually produced by the Aldrin Foundation and it is going to be part of our challenge. Now, I'm going to pass over to our very special guest, Jim Christensen, who uh, Ben has already introduced as the, the Chief Innovation Officer from the Aldrin Foundation. You may have um, noticed that in the video, the, the image of um, people landing on the moon. 
Now, in that capsule was Buzz Aldrin. Now, who is the, the patron of the Aldrin Family Foundation? But rather than me tell you about that, I'm going to pass over to the expert, Jim, who's going to tell you much more. Scott, first, it is so incredible to be here. Um, I, ju I just want to tell you, I, uh, I am located, uh-oh, green screen does funny things. <laughs> I'm located in Florida, which is essentially on the opposite side of the world from Australia. Um, one time we counted our uh, lapse time when I would speak, and it was taking us 1.25 seconds for my signal to get to you in Australia. So I'm about as far away in the world as I can be from you. And someday I look forward to visiting you. And congratulations on being selected by NASA to build the rover. The experience you have in mining remotely, that's remarkable. If you can do it at 1,000 miles, you can do it at 250,000 miles. Same difference, just a little bit different environments. Like Scott was saying, I work for the Aldrin Family Foundation. Buzz Aldrin is our, is our patron. Uh, my boss is Dr. Andy Aldrin, uh, Buzz's son. And what we do is we try to inspire kids. In, in fact, we try to inspire everyone uh, in, in space and, and exploration. Our tagline is inspiring the next generation of space explorers. Uh, one thing that, that we were talking about was that you didn't have the opportunity to see this. I did. Uh, about 51 years ago, uh, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin stepped on the moon, the, fir the first people to walk on the moon. You know, that's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. And uh, there's, that's Buzz standing there on the surface of the moon doing some science. And it's, it's worth knowing that that's been quite a long time ago. Now, America, in cooperation with a lot of people, with a lot of different countries, is getting ready to go back. And I've got to move a little bit here in, my, in front of my screen, but I've got the Artemis logo. And Artemis, uh, Artemis is the sister of Apollo. And uh, given that, it's the, that the sister of Apollo is the name, I think you can guess what we're planning to do is put the first women on the moon and the next man. And when we go, we expect to be staying. We expect to land and we expect to set up a base and we expect to do real work. And something you'll notice in this picture is how high the earth is above the horizon. And that's because we're planning on landing at the South Pole. And the reason we're looking at the South Pole is because that's where we think the most water is located. Now, one of the things that your rover is going to do is going to go up and it's going to look for oxygen bearing rocks. But also we're gonna be looking, we're going to be sending up a rover that's looking for water bearing rocks. Because if you can provide oxygen and you can provide water, and at the South Pole, you have almost an uninterrupted solar supply of energy, you can be producing rocket fuel, oxygen, hydrogen. You can have drinking water. You can do those. You can have those things that's essential in order to, to, uh, to stay. So I've got one more, one more picture here. We've got, we've got astronauts out there actually doing real work over time and, and setting up essentially a settlement. The idea is that there will be uh, multiple segments to this mission. One will be an orbiting station called Gateway. Another one will be a lander that will go to the surface. And a third will be a, a, a structure that, that people will live on on the surface. And I think you're going to be able to expect that we're going to look up at the moon and say, who's up there right now? Oh, who just came back? And I think there's going to come a time very soon that when we look at the moon, we'll be thinking about that there are people there. Uh, that's going to be pretty spectacular. Well, that brings me to what I really wanted to talk about. This is a very famous picture. It's a picture of a boot print that, that Buzz put on the moon and took a picture of. And a, a lot has changed since this picture was taken. In fact, uh, Jackie, we've got a, uh, Jackie has prepared a, a question for us, a survey question. And I'd like you to all just consider that. So Jackie, if you'd put that up right now, uh, and then you can you can respond.
So okay. with that up there, when we go up to the top, hit ahaslides.com forward slash AVAW2. Uh, no worries if it takes a little bit of time, because we do know that some of you might be in a location where uh, the internet's are playing up a little bit. Uh, go ahead, Jim. Okay. Thanks, Ben. Okay, so I was messing around with my phone the other day, and I was thinking about the power of my phone compared to the power of the computers uh, that were used to land on the moon. So what I'd like to know is, is a modern mobile phone about as powerful as the computer and the lunar lander, the lunar lander and the command module computers combined, the lander, the command module and the rocket, or all the computers that were used in the mission, mission control and those three other, those three other vehicles. And you have some time to think about that. And I'm going to go back to my presentation, but you can mess around with that and decide which. And then we have been messing around with actually trying to come up with the absolute answer in terms of numbers. And that's a harder number to come by than what, than what you'd expect. But we think we know what the answer is and we'll certainly discuss it. Okay, so I've got a couple minutes left here. I'd like to talk a little bit about Home on the Moon because you're designing to live on the moon. Now, quite some time ago, COVID hit America, hit Australia about the same time. And at the time COVID hit um, America, um, I was traveling a lot. I was going to the airport twice a week. I was flying someplace. I was all over the place. And the truth is, I was really enjoying it. And then it all stopped. And I was at home and I set up my computer on a desk and I'm sitting at my end of the table, kind of looking blankly at the walls and, and it hits me. I might as well be on the moon because I can't go anyplace else. And I thought, wait a minute, I might as well be on the moon. And I began to think about that what it was that I needed. I need air, water, food, shelter, and energy. That's what everybody needs. That's what any living thing needs in order to live. You need those five things. We have systems in my house that provide all of those things. We've got air conditioning. We've got HVAC systems. Of course, you can open the, open the windows and get air, but I've got an HVAC system in my house for ventilation. We've got plumbing. Uh, we've got electricity. Uh, we were having our food delivered in the early days of COVID. Uh, our, our house is built to shelter us. And I begin to think, how much do I actually use? And how do these systems actually work? Because so I'll tell you something about systems for space. They're not entirely different than the systems in your home. Uh, it's not as if we do things one way on earth and we do them an entirely different way in space. These systems have evolved and there's a relationship between them. The people that designed your air conditioning are related to the people, are on the continuum of the people to design the HVAC system for International Space Station and who will design it to, for a, a lunar base. And so I began to think about it in that way and started asking students, how do your systems work? How would you modify them? Another thing I asked students to do was, Figure out exactly how much of everything you're using. When you actually gather data of how much water you use in a day, it's a little bit surprising. Uh, how much food you actually use, how much energy you actually use, all those things. If, if you, when you start messing around with that, it, you, you come up with some interesting numbers. Well, when you get numbers and you start looking at how the systems work, you can start redesigning them. The next thing is, what would you like a house to look like? What do you need in terms of your structure? So what I did with Home on the Moon was I put all that together. Now, part of what I did was I also created a story, what we called a backstory. And, and the story was, how did we get to the place where we need to think about putting people on the moon and having people live there? And it all has to do with this picture because what I was picturing was, there gets to be a time when there are people on the moon and it starts being tourists on the moon. I don't know if you noticed the other day, William Shatner, Captain Kirk flew into space. It's not gonna be long and there's gonna be people that wanna go land on the moon. 
People that can afford it are going to start doing this. They're going to be tourists. Where would you want to go? Well, I'll tell you where I'd like to go. I would like to go to Tranquility Base, and I would like to see where the first moon landing was. What happens if somebody walks up to that footprint and kicks dirt on it? Actually, regolith on it. So I thought, oh, you know what we need is we need to have people that would go up and build family home outposts to live at each one of the Apollo landing sites. And I started designing around that idea. Now, part of what we did was I, I created a, a set, well, I, a set of assumptions you can work from, um, some ideas about how to go about this, some procedures you can use, and all that's open to you. It's on our website, on our aldernfoundation.org website. I also set up a, a bunch, a lot of resources that you can go through. And I organized it according to our project. Now, ultimately, what I was expecting to have happen was for people to send me either written papers or videos or who knows what, pictures of, of physical models. And I started getting these pictures and videos and models from all over the world. Boy, did I have fun looking at these things. Anyway, that was home on the moon. And uh, I would really encourage you that as you're working on this project, take a look at home on the moon. It's at aldrinfoundation.org. Uh, what you'll find out is I'm not a YouTube host. <laughs> I'm in the videos, but you can tell that's not who I am. Uh, I'm, just, I'm just Jim and I just like to do this. Uh, okay, so I wanna go on just a little bit. We did do, with Home on the Moon, it seemed like such a good idea. I went on and did a couple more of them. Uh, we've got Home on the Moon. We have one where you design a museum. You know, I used to be the education director at Kennedy Space Center. And uh, so I asked kids to design a uh, uh, visitor complex uh, that would preserve and protect an Apollo landing site and to while telling the story and honoring the crew. Uh, we came up with one called School on the Moon where we asked kids to work as a class to figure out how, uh, how they would build for their class. We came up with one called Let the Games Begin, where we asked students to design games that would work in 1.6G. And then finally, we have one called the Aldrin Cycler Challenge. The idea being that you could mine the moon, throw the ore into space, process it in microgravity, build giant structures with it, and then uh, create a spacecraft that you could put an orbit around the sun that would intersect the orbit of the earth and the moon. Okay, one last thing and then my time is gone. We do have one other project I'd like to just point out. Uh, we have one called Project Janos going on right now. And what Project Janos does is has about um, four videos and then it has activities that go along with them. And if you look up, www.pepper.com uh, Project Yonos. You can get that link and, and I can post that link. I can get uh, Ben to post that link. Uh, I think you'd find that to be interesting and good resources. Okay, I'm not exactly sure where I am on my time. Ben, how am I doing? Mate, you are doing fine. Uh, I was just thinking too, if you're wondering uh, where to find a number of these resources, these are on the uh in the in the student folios and on the ava page in the uh in the resource section just below the uh folios too so you can definitely find those and uh, i must say there's so many different opportunities in fact ted told me that literally this weekend this weekend if you look up hashtag observe the moon so hashtag observe the moon you'll find that right around the world on october 16 all sorts of stuff's happening and in fact, you can even get involved. So just look up hashtag uh, uh, observe the moon. You will find a lot of that stuff. But look, thank you so much, Jim, for, uh, for letting us look in a little bit of your world. I love what our home in the moon is all about. And uh, uh, really, uh, I hope that sort of gets people thinking about what if they design something that might fit in one of those homes, Jim? That'd be awesome. I'm really interested in what, what you come up with. I want to maintain my contact with you. It has been absolutely an honor to work with this group and what a great project this is. Mate, much appreciated. Now, actually, that tells me a lot about the next part of this. Remember I told everyone uh, this is Project Management Week because you have to think about where are we going in this challenge. At the end of these six weeks, we're on week two, we are 
creating a one minute video, one minute pitch, maybe a one minute claymation video, it doesn't matter. Some form of descriptive way of what you've designed for your design challenge, which means you really have a project on your hands. You've got teams, you've got materials, you have a timeline and you've got ideas. That can be a little bit challenging in a lot of ways. And the good news is, is that uh, Alan Ryan, who's going to be speaking very, very soon, in fact, right as soon as I stop, is a master when it comes to helping people get their ideas out of their brain and getting stuff done. So, uh, Alan, can you let us know a little bit in about your world and uh, what we can get up to, mate? Okay, thank you, Ben. Um, and welcome to everybody. I'm Alan Ryan from the Hargraves Institute. I'm just talking to you for a short amount of time about project management. And there are two activities. So you'll need either a pen or paper or a digital notepad or Word document. And we'll also do a quick little poll. And so my objective today is to give you two tips and hints about how to be a good project manager. And so the important thing to just start off is thinking about your own experience. Have you ever done a project or a homework project where you were given a week or two weeks to do it? and you didn't start it until the night before it was due. And suddenly you said, oh, it's due tomorrow. And you worked really, really hard and you finished the project and you delivered it on time and you got a good result. We call that in the business world, last minute project management. And so even though you're given a long amount of time, you do it in the last minute. And it's a good thing because you are more creative when you have a deadline and you're more creative when you're trying to achieve something quickly. And so one of the skills of project management is doing things fast. So my first challenge for you today is I'm going to give you 30 seconds to come up with as many ideas as you can. And I'll give you the question in a second. So have it either notepad or uh, pen or do it digitally. And I'm just gonna give you 30 seconds on my good old clock and say, Please come up with as many creative ideas as you can if you had a moon rock to work with. So on your mark, get set, 30 seconds, as many ideas as you can. What would you do with a moon rock? What a great question. Now, I know I don't want to have too much voice coming out of this because you, you all need to think. So think a, a little bit. I'm going to ask you one what would be one idea that you might do with it, Alan? Just, just, just curious. Well, I'm very fortunate that um, if you go to Canberra, to the Geoscience Australia, uh, in the foyer, there is a moon rock and you can actually touch it and play with it. And so I would use it as a tourist attraction. Stop, 30 seconds is up. What I'd like everybody to do is to count the number of ideas that you've come up with. Count the number of ideas and Jackie's going to put a poll up and the poll is going to, going to, and I'd just like you to enter in how many ideas you came up with, okay? And so that's one of the key things about project management is you can do things fast. The problem with doing things in the last minute is that sometimes it's too late and you can't do everything in the last minute. And so what you have to do is break up your project into lots of little points in time. What are you doing this week? What are you doing next week? What are you doing the week after? and deliver each one each time so that you achieve your goal in the end because you can't leave everything to the last minute, but you actually have lots of different timelines, lots of different gates, they call them, where you deliver lots and lots of things. So that's the first rule to remember is you can do things very fast and you can do things in a timed way, okay? So enter the score in how many ideas you came up with 30 seconds. And then I would like to move on to the second thing I'd like to teach you today. And what I'd like to share with you today is how do you work in a team? So here are the scores. Have a look. So can we put the scores back up, Jackie? So we've got nearly half of you have got one to three ideas. You've got four to six ideas, seven to nine ideas. And then a bunch of you have got 10 plus ideas. And I thank you. You can generate a lot of ideas in a short amount of time. Thank you, Jackie. So next question is how do you work as a team? And working as a team is really, really important. And working as a team does not mean that you all have to sit together or be online together and be, and be together all the time. Working as a team with project management means you get together, you work out the tasks, you then do your tasks independently, and then you come back together to share what you've done. 
And that's how you get lots and lots of activities happening. So I've got a second um, challenge for you now. This time, this is a really important challenge. This is a two minute challenge. And in this two minute challenge, I, I want you to think up as many creative ideas as you can for your pitch, for your pitch at the end of the six weeks of this project. What are all the different creative ideas you can come up with with your pitch starting now? And this time you have two minutes to do the pitch. And so all the different creative ideas you can come up with in your, um, in your pitch. And this is where everything goes quiet. And this is where Ben comes up and asks me another difficult question to, um, uh, to give you some sidetracks and stuff. Um, but I'm just giving you two minutes. Sure. I'll tell you what, I, I personally, uh, it's so tempting to um, just create a video. That's perfectly fine. A video would make sense. What if you did it as a podcast? That's just an idea. It doesn't have to be a podcast. But there's many ways to story? present information, right? Yeah. And you can also build something and then take a video of what you built. Yeah, that'd be great because that's the thing when you think about podcasts and that's only audio because you can't explain what you've designed. That would be a great way to then take that idea to another level. So visual and audio. Cool. Well, could you embed slides? You can embed slides. You can embed conversations. And the beautiful challenge of this project is whatever you produce has to be delivered in a minute. And so you can do an awful lot in a minute. And Ben and I are just keeping you confused while we talk, while we wait for the two minutes to be up. Have you noticed love two you. minutes is a long amount of time? Right? Well, when you're Ellen, just absolutely focusing on two minutes. Go I'd ahead, love Ted. to see a TikTok video. <laughs> yeah, TikTok video would be awesome. Absolutely. Yes. And actually, you think about it, you might be able to incorporate story. Because story has some emotion and emotion breeds connection. And connection means people are invested in your idea. Oh, that's an art. Storytelling. Absolutely. And you can also then, who do you interview or talk to different people that you wouldn't normally talk to and bring them in there. So I've got 10 more seconds. I was uh, on the TikTok theme, interpretive dance was one of my ideas, Ben. Well, actually, I'll, I'll have to see that. <laughs> there is, oh, there is, dance, That's there is dance your thesis. That's the thing. Sorry, go ahead, Alan. Two minutes, put your pens down. Again, Jackie's gonna launch a post. How many ideas? Now here, so count off your ideas, enter it into the um, poll. Here is the secret. If you've got three or four people in your team and you say, we're going to think up all the different ways that we can, um, all the different things we can do for our pitch, and you give yourselves two minutes and you do it independently, and each of you come up with five ideas or ten ideas, but they're independent and there's, let's assume there's four people in your team, and they come up with five ideas each, suddenly you've got 20 ideas that you can work with. And that's the magic of working together and then working separately and then working together again. Don't give yourself two days to come up with five ideas. Give yourself two minutes to come up with five ideas, then share your ideas. So Jackie, how is the poll going? So just have a look. Now we've got the average in the middle is around four to six ideas. Um, there is still a quarter of you got 10 plus ideas. And so again, if I just pick the ones in the middle, we've got four to six ideas and, um, or seven to nine ideas. That's interesting. I can't do an average. Um, if there's four people in your team, suddenly you've got 16 to 40 ideas to look at and you've done it in two minutes. So I just want to summarize and then I'll get out of your... Uh, presentation and pass back to Ben. My summary is this. When you do project management, break the project down into little pieces and deliver things in little pieces like this Friday we're doing this, next Friday we're doing that. All the instructions are in your student folio. Then you can work fast. Don't give yourself a day to do something. Give yourself five minutes. Give yourself 10 minutes and work together as a team, then work separately, individually, and then come back together and agree. And when you agree and look at all those ideas, don't criticise each other's ideas. Don't argue. Just pick what's the best idea or the most creative idea and then move forward. And the last point to highlight is when you look at all your ideas and you have lots of ideas, which one is going to bring the biggest impact? It's going to be the easiest to do, going to achieve your result. Pick the ideas that work for you. 
don't try to pick some ginormous idea that's going to take forever. Just pick the ideas that will work for you and then grab them and then move on. So last minute is good. Working fast is good. Working together and working separately is good. Having a project plan, which is called a Gantt chart, is good. We use a product called Trello, which is on online project management, which is free, is good. There's lots and lots of good things. And I was just want to share those tips with you today. So thank you, Ben, and I'll hand back to Ben. Look, I'm so, so happy that you could join us, Alan, absolutely. And by the way, if you, uh, if you find that you can't get those pieces of software, there's always more than one piece of software that will do the job. And one thing about the ideas, did you notice that uh, throughout an idea podcast, then we moved to let's, let, let's do a bit more video. And then out of left field, we had interpretive dance. Now, here's the thing. You might have gone, seriously, is that possible? You know what? What you didn't hear is none of us said that was a bad idea. In fact, it could be that perhaps that's a way to connect with an idea that was not thought of. So as you build more and more ideas, the first couple are fairly predictable. It's the ones afterwards that become very interesting. And maybe you can weave those ideas together. Thank you so much, Alan. Really, really, really appreciate you being involved in this project. Um, now, here's the thing. Uh, Wendy does very much want to make sure that we know exactly where we're going with the student folios, with the ones that you are working on. So, uh, Wendy, could you uh, give us a bit of a recap of what happened last week and where we're going this week? Oh, definitely. Thanks, Ben. Um, so last week in our first lesson, we firstly looked at the characteristics of a high performing team. And there were six characteristics, diversity, communication, clear goals, leadership, trust, respect and managing conflict. And you can find all of those on page six of the week one folio. During the week one, we also started to talk about brainstorming and Mr. Preston, Ian, he went through that activity with you. And now that we've heard from Alan, this week we want to really drill down into those activities in the week, week two folio. And that's what Ian and I are about to do with you. So you know how to implement Alan's strategies into your project work. Over to you, Ian. Thanks, Wendy. Jackie, can we um, throw up page 10 from the folio for this week? So students can see that as we're going through. So with our folio this week, remember to the teachers out there that each week there is a folio that we put onto the ABA website. Um, and you're, you're welcome to download those folios and use them in your classes um, as, as you need to. Uh, it's always a good idea to have the folios for the kids before the, the presentation, if that's possible. But on page 10 of this week, it really follows on nicely from Alan's presentation that we just had. And continues on with what we talked about last week with uh, brainstorming and I want to anchor back to what it, this challenge is all about in six weeks and our goal at the end is to provide a pitch which goes for one minute and we need to design a new plant growth mission and that plant growth mission can occur either on the International Space Centre or on the moon and we're looking at giving those ideas to Ted and and um picking out which, which are the best ones. So that's that's anchoring back to what this whole activity, this whole challenge is all about. On page 10 of our folio this week, you'll see one of the ways that we can do our ideation or our brainstorming is what's called the ideas blitz. And as Alan was just saying, the ideas blitz, the reason or the idea of that is to come up rapidly with lots and lots of solutions or lots of ideas that, that we can work with. The Ideas Blitz has five stages to it, and you'll see those on the on the uh, on the left hand side there, down towards the bottom. And Wendy and I are going to go through those five stages. So the first stage, stage one. Uh, if we go to the second page or page eleven, please, Jackie. So the first the first part of the of the Ideas Blitz though we start is that we want the individuals working by themselves initially to come up and try and get nine ideas within a two minute time frame. Okay, so as Alan was saying, don't spend a week doing this, don't spend half an hour doing this, let's do this rapidly. So in a two minute period, and you'll see the red circles on the inside, the red circles on the inside is where those nine ideas go. So have a timer, have a countdown, Get as many as you can, but try to get nine in that in that first two minute period. After you've got that, we go to stage two, which is the enhance, and then we start to use the blue circles on the outside. So what we do then is, if we've got an idea um, in our red circle, in the blue circle above it, we want to build on that idea. We want to add something to it. 
We want to take it further, something positive. So we want to think, yes, and we could do this with it, or we could we could go further by doing by doing this next step. We don't want to have a yes, but this might not work. Okay, we don't want that negativity. So we get our nine ideas in the red circles, and then from the the red circles, each of those blue circles, we we add to our idea. And I just want to point out as well for the teachers out there that if you would like these as black line masters, you can go onto the website and you can download freely. Um, there, there's a three page document that you can download that has those black line masters ready there for you. And also, if you'd like, you can also download an app from the App Store with, with, um, with the Ideas Blitz. I'll hand over to Wendy now. Wendy's going to go through stage three. Thank you, Ian. Uh, Jackie, can we please move on to page 12 of the folio? Because 12, uh, page 12 outlines the third stage. Now, this is where we want to, want to connect all of the ideas that you come up with. If I use the example from last week where you had to innovate different flavours of ice cream, in the middle circle, I would write ice cream flavour. And then I tried to pull the ideas that we've come up with. And one really exciting one last week was a savoury flavour for ice cream. So then I would write savoury flavour in the blue circle that's to the top right-hand side. So we're branching out towards the top right-hand side. And then from the savoury flavour, well, what did we come up with last week? I think some students said chilli, some said bacon, and some said really, really salty ice cream. So using this diagram, you can start to bring all of your ideas together and put them into groups. Okay, so just recapping, in the middle circle, you put your overall idea. It was ice cream flavor. That's what we were trying to solve. Then in the second dot, second circle coming out, well, we grouped all of the flavors that were savory flavors, as opposed to sweet. Over the page, um, thanks Jackie, page 13, the fourth stage of brainstorming is to evaluate our ideas. So you're then going to transfer all of your thoughts and your ideas and your solutions into these boxes, starting from one to 10. So one would be the best one that you're working on and nine would be the least. Oh, there should, should be another box on there, um, but nine or 10. So this is where you start to think about your ideas and what they would actually look like for your solution and you rank them. So I'll just pass over to Ian now to look at the evaluation stage. Okay, thanks, Wendy. And um, Jackie, can we go over to page 14 of the folio, please? And with the ideas blitz, one thing which I want to point out, uh, a bit like the folio and all the activities that we provide for teachers and students, you, you don't need to do every single activity that we that we provide for you. Uh, you pick and choose the ones that suit you and your school and your students or your cohort. With the ideas blitz, very, very similar. There are five steps to it. You don't need to do every single step. It depends on what, what you're trying to do and how it helps you. The only step that is essential is step one. So step one, where we had those, those nine ideas in that two minute, that is, that is the most crucial step. There are four other steps that you can follow, but back at your school, you might choose to go from step one, then straight to step three or, or whatever the case may be. So just an important point there for teachers. Now on our page here, page 14, we're looking at evaluating. And again, as Alan spoke about before, we wanna have a high impact. We want something that's going to really make a difference with our ideas, but we also don't want it to be uh, too onerous or too hard. So with our ideas that we come up with, we have this little grid here broken into quadrants. And so down on the, if you like the X scale, we've got from hard to easy. And you will go across there and you will plot how hard or how easy your idea is. And, and hopefully your idea is quite an easy idea. So your, your dot would be right across the right hand side there. And then you look at the impact. Now, once again, we're looking for a high impact. So hopefully our little dot, if you like, um, that Y axis is right up there towards that number one. So we have our two points and we just join those two, do a horizontal and a vertical line and draw those two, those two points together to where it intersects and we see which quadrant we end up in. Now, ideally we wanna end up in quadrant two. So quadrant two is our idea is quite easy. We, we can do that you know, uh, very, very, uh, 
very easily and also has a massive or a high impact. So quadrant two is where we would want to be. We certainly wouldn't want to be in quadrant three. Quadrant three, it's obviously it's very hard and it has very low impact. So that's a that's we call that the impact effort matrix, and it's a really good graphical tool to um, to very very quickly uh, plot the effectiveness of of what you're planning um, to then try and work out which one you proceed with. And I believe Wendy, you've got page fifteen. Definitely. Okay, so you're down right to the end of deciding your solution, but you still are unsure which two or three solutions you want to actually use. Here's yet another tool that you can use. And with this one on page 15, thanks, Jackie, we now write out the problem. We really need to focus. Let's have that across the top. What are we trying to solve? Then write your three solutions in the boxes. Underneath each solution, think about the pros and the cons. So with the pros, what is a good reason to use that solution? Why, does, why is that solution going to work? And with the cons, you write down, well, why wouldn't that solution work? And then once you've written the pros and the cons, it should become clear as to what solution you need to follow. In actual fact, using pros and cons is something that you can use in your everyday life for any situation. It definitely helps you make that final decision. And then in the bottom box, write out your final solution. So you've got your idea. The next step on page 16 is to start to write out your design brief. So what is the purpose of your design? How will your success actually be measured? Now we need to think of the outcomes of your solution. This is not easy, but this is where it's challenging you and this is what you need to have in order to be innovative. If you get stuck on some of this part, just have a look down the bottom there. There are three icons. You can click on those in the folio or on the AVA website and they will give you more resources to support your understanding and your learnings. But now Alan touched on time management and how you need to set small goals and checklists to end up with your final solution. And I'm going to pass over to Ian because he's going to talk to you about a very special chart that project managers use. Thanks, Wendy. Uh, Jackie, can we go to page 17 on the folio, please? And just while that's coming up, I was really, I was surprised, but also happy to hear Alan say that last minute is good because I, I'm I, I typically do a lot of things at the last minute um, and I, I find that's when I'm most creative and, and probably get my best work done. But as a teacher with students, I don't really particularly want my students with big projects leaving those to the last minute. So um, one way that we, that we look at trying to manage that project is to do what's called a Gantt chart. Now a Gantt chart is, is a fancy name and I suppose really you could also call it a time action chart. So if you see on the top of page 17 there, we've got, um, we've got a table set up. That's our Gantt chart. And on the left-hand side, we've got, um, we've got eight steps there that the project is broken up into. And across the top, we've got weeks and we've got uh, 10 weeks available. Now with your challenge, you only have six weeks and we're in week two already. And once you choose what you're going to do, remember at the end, it's a one minute pitch for our experiment that, um, that we think we should run, you need to work out how in the period of six weeks you're going to get from where we started last week to having that deliverable in six weeks' time. So the Gantt chart is a really good tool for doing that. Um, I have my students quite often do their Gantt charts inside a spreadsheet like Microsoft Excel. That's an easy way to be able to get that structure there. Um, some students like to go into PowerPoint and bring in a, a table or go into Microsoft Word and, and do a table. There's a whole series of different ways that you can draw that Gantt chart. It can be you know, quite simply just a pen and paper activity and you know, the teacher might have a, a pro forma that you give to the students with, um, you know, with the weeks across the top and, and the action plan or the tasks down the side. Also with those weeks, you don't need to break it up into weeks um, as weeks one to six, you might have, um, so inside week one, you might have Monday, Wednesday, Friday, you might meet three times a week to do this task. And so you can break, you can break your weeks up further if, if need be. 
If we go across now, Jackie, to page, our last page on our folio, page 18, and Alan mentioned this one before as well, there are a number of online tools that you can use for project management and an Australian um, example of project management, which some schools it's available to, depending on whether you're a, a uh, a government school or a private school or independent school um, is what's called Trello. So it's a piece of Australian software. It combines project management with team communication. Uh, there are some free templates that you can use. Um, so that, that is one way that you can use an online tool uh, to, to collaborate, but um, there are lots and lots of tools out there. That's all right. So now look, much appreciated for uh, joining us. Now, we do we did allow a little bit of time in case you may want to uh, ask some questions because, hey, that, that can always be handy too. But the number one question we should be asking is, what are we going to solve? How are we going to solve it? And when, by? And what's it going to look like? I suppose. So, I mean, sort of think about this as, as questions may come through. Just wondering, team, as a, a, like uh, in, in amongst all the panel, just sort of throwing out, out there as a bit of a, Bit of a wild, wild goose question in some ways. Uh, if you had to get a team together and you thought, you know what, I was going to grow something, and I've got some materials at home, some materials at school, what would be the first steps? Like now, I've got my team together. Like I mean, we've gone through the steps in this hour. I mean, how how do you feel with the with trying to get all these ideas down? I mean, what sort of ideas have you been thinking about during this hour that perhaps it might be possible as we look, wait for questions to come through? Just throwing it out there. Well, Ben, I've got, uh, maybe I have a privileged position having done some of these already. You know, Exolab 9 here um, is something that the students can follow along. We're actually just starting a second cohort for that. You know, when we're actually investigating what uh, life might do uh, in a partial gravity environment, like on the surface of the moon uh, or on Mar uh, Mars or even here on, on our planet. Our soils, our living soils are really, really important. And without our, those, trillions of microbes in a handful of, uh, of, of rich, lush, living earth, uh, we wouldn't have all the other life we had. We, you, we wouldn't be having this conversation. Uh, and Mars actually doesn't have that. The moon, no, the moon doesn't have an atmosphere either. So it's going to be a real tough go. But I think Jim's got some ideas there. His home on the moon, you know, you've got a habitat, you've got to think about power and you're going to have to think about food. So I would start just as a fun thing. You got the two minutes, right? Or the minute or whatever. You're going to have to crank out a lot of ideas What's your favorite food? You know, I have some kids saying, I want pizza in space. All right, well, how are you going to figure that out? And uh, where are your resources going to come from? You might be really practical, you know. You know, I really don't like broccoli, but I'm looking at this list of vitamins and nutrients. And wow, that seems like a pretty good thing. Is it going to be easy to grow or difficult? How much power will you need? How much light? Water. Um, and then again, if you can bring it back home. Again, we're these virtual astronauts, at least for these next few weeks. Um, and you're in your space capsule, maybe your space capsule is just your garden in your backyard, or maybe you're in apartments in your kitchen windowsill. Just start a simple experiment. That little seed, well, you, you hear people talk about a seed of an idea, right, Ben? Why is that? Just take any old seed, find it. Maybe you had some fruit today or what have you. Grab it, put, in, put it in a, some soil or put it just in water. Is anything going to happen? Does it have some sunlight? Maybe look up Google, use Google, do a little search. What's your favorite food? I mean, just have some fun in addition to thinking about how you might solve it. And that's all I'd say, Ben, and uh, I'm really excited to hearing what people come up with here, what our students and maybe even our teachers want to get involved uh, and, and consider what the possibilities might be. But I'm really excited to hear what people have to say and what great guidance. Uh, you guys are really getting a formula, right? A formula for life. What Wendy said, you don't, you know, what, as you work through this project, you're going to be able to think this way in your practice and as you get older. And so really exciting stuff. Absolutely. And uh, uh, great advice. I mean, I remember trying, Ted, um, uh, could I grow a mango from a mango seed? Hey, mango season's coming, at least down in this, this, this side of the world. Down this I way. love mangoes. You totally can do it. Dry it out. It actually works. Uh, you got to split the husk out. Uh, but yeah, try it. So why not? I like that challenge. Look at what's in your fridge or off your trees or what you're hanging around. Can you regrow that? It's a little side thing. It's absolutely. Now, uh, here's the thing too. Projects look daunting when you first have them in front of you. They really do. But you know what? Let's keep with it. The pizza idea. How do you eat a whole pizza? One slice at a time. <laughs> and for me, that's done in one night. Almost. 
<laughs> I do like my pizza. Anyway, so look, thank you very much for uh, coming along for this, this field challenge. And now what's happening next week? Uh, well, it's a little bit different. First week of this challenge was setting your team and thinking a little bit about what we might achieve. This week, we've been thinking about, well, project management. Let's get our project together. Let's get it all sorted. Let's get our ideas together so the project can sing. Well, the third week, next week, is all about design. Well, once we've got our ideas and we know what we want to sort of roughly produce, designing it, getting your ideas out of your head and onto paper is a skill. And we do have a couple of really special guests coming up next week. Again, if you're wondering where all the, all the information is for this particular uh, challenge, look on the STEM 2021 website. Uh, and we can put the link in the chat as well. And it'll have all the downloadable information. And we're constantly updating it. So it's not a static page. Uh, and if you're wondering about this particular recording, it will go onto the page uh, either later on this afternoon or worst case tomorrow, but most likely later on this afternoon so that you can have this. We are also aware that we are we do have lots of different schools uh, in different departments of education. We have independent schools, uh, uh, diocese schools, and there are different schools in different countries, which means everyone's got different rules about the different software they can use and whether you can watch certain things. So we are adjusting as we go along and uh, we really are happy that you can join us. Look, Thank you very much uh, for, for, from all of us. And um, look, enjoy your morning. And if you're watching this recording, enjoy your evening or your afternoon, wherever it is. Thank you, Alan, Ryan, much appreciated. Thank you, Jim Christensen, for coming along. Uh, much appreciated. And uh, Ted Tagami, Scott Sleep, Wendy Boat, Ian Preston, and special thanks too to Peter Dowler and, and, and Jackie Cow from Physics Education, powering and doing all the button pressing in behind the scenes. Uh, much appreciate. I'm going to wave. Have a fantastic uh, morning or whatever you're doing. We'll see you next week.